Hi all, thank you very much for joining us today with an extremely interesting person, a person who I follow personally on the social network. Uh, we are now hosting Dr. Roy Cezana. Uh, Roy, thank you very much for participating in our podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, some words about our guest. Uh, Dr. Cezana is a future studies researcher with a PhD in nanotechnology. Uh, for the past 10 years, Roy has been doing research at Tel Aviv University. And in the last seven years, he was a researcher in the Balvatnik Center for Interdisciplinary Cyber Research. Uh, for the past three years, Roy has been doing research in XPRIZE, where he mainly focused on the future of forest work and especially longevity and age reversal. He worked a few books, some of which got translated to English, Russian, and Chinese. He is a global person, we told you in advance, and he's also conducting a research on AI and its implication for humanity. A super interesting person. Thank you so much, Ray, for uh, letting us host you. So let's start with the first question. What would you see or what you consider to be the trends in the robotic industry and specifically with relation to the future of men and machines? Yeah, so first we see an exponential advancement in the field, much as in AI in general. And that's not surprising because you need AI in order to make robots move, to make them uh, understand what to do and so on. And the capabilities of robots today are pretty amazing when you consider the DARPA urban robotics competition from 2014, where DARPA invited the, some of the most highly regarded companies in the world to demonstrate their robots and their take on robots that could actually do things that only human beings could do at that time, like drive a car or open a door. Um, and honestly, most of the robots there, well, all of the robots there were slow, so slow. I mean, they could, they could, they could walk a few steps and it would take them minutes to do that. And the, the, the audience was up on their feet for 30 minutes and didn't know when to clap exactly. So they're so slow, so clumsy. And just six years later, you can see Boston Dynamics robots. Everybody knows about Boston Dynamics, right? Right. Um, so you can see them uh, dancing to rhythm. They can, you can see them planting saplings. You can see Spot with its arm on the back, cleaning the dishes and many other tasks that we would have seen deemed impossible just a mere five years ago. So that's the pace of advancement in the, the robotics industry. Now, uh, on the, in another trend is that robots are beginning to learn how on their own, how to move in simulations. You can see that in OpenAI, they are running simulations to help robots understand how, how to coordinate their movements, the movement of their legs or bodies and so on. And one last thing, we see robots and people starting to figure out how to walk together. I mean, we're seeing robots on the streets, right? In New York City, in California. Then we see delivery robots on the ground. Uh, we see aerial drones up in the sky. They recently got uh, permission to deliver um, uh, presents and uh, drugs to, to people um, in their houses. But we don't yet know what are the new rules the unwritten rules. And the way that Kevin Kelly put it, every new technology, for every new technology, it takes some time until we civilize it, until we make it part of this uh, civilization, just like smartphones. You remember when we had smartphones 20 years ago and they used to constantly ring in restaurants, in movie, hall, uh, movie halls and so on. And then we finally figured out, okay, maybe it's not such a good idea to have them ring all the time. So we understood how to civilize that technology. The same needs to happen with robots. And for example, in some places, people treat round delivery robots as nuisance because they also use the pavement. Well, should they use the pavement? What are the, the rules of who who goes first? Um, picture, people are worried about aerial drones and for a very good reason. They can take pictures of everything they, they can see, including potentially through windows. So what should be new roles, rules? What are, should be the new laws about that? Um, and finally, it turns out that people actually take more heed when robots are telling them what to do. 
Mm. How do we make sure that this power isn't misused? So lots of questions, lots of answers, but it's very difficult to know which answers are the right ones so far. So in, in, thank you very much for the deal of answer, but with the regard of the dancing between the robots and the human kind, how would you see them living together in terms of the future, in terms of regulation, privacy, uh, breaking into the home of people? And should they have, for example, uh, embrace emotions in their AI? Should they be specifically designed to perform functional activities or a combination of both that obviously is being taken out of the circumstances and the relationship with the people? Just one small question. At hospitals, uh, taking care of people who are here or are lying at bed, should the robot uh, reflect some kind of an emotion embracing the patient? or just be functional, giving him the med him or her the medicine. I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. So that reminds me of a conversation I had with one of the engineers in Boston Dynamics. Um, she came to present their robots and you know, that it's great publicity and so on. <laughs> and at the end of the lecture, I raised my hand and they said, okay, that's fantastic. I mean, your robots move like human beings. They look like human beings and so on, but why? Why do, do you need them to look like a construct that basically evolved throughout millions of years so that it can walk, it can run, it can jump, it can copulate with other people. And in fact, the, the way we're shaped makes sure that we can give birth. Well, well you know, <laughs> have the population, thankfully. Um, so why, do, why are you trying so hard? to emulate this, <laughs> this imperfect form when you could use forms that are much more practical for many other uses. And I don't remember her answer, honestly. I only remember my questions. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but um, if, why do you need an emotional robot? The worst kind of thing you could have is an emotional robot, is a car that says, oh, I'm so tired and bored of driving you around. Let's find some new thrills out there in the road. And the last thing you want is your computer to have an emo breakdown. So <laughs> we definitely don't need emotional robots in most circumstances with one caveat. And that, as you said, is when human beings actually need some kind of emotion displays from the robots. Even then, this display of emotions must be completely artificial. I mean, the robot still needs to know that it is not allowed to actually smash the dishes and walk out the house if you mistreat it. But I'm not sure how long this is going to be the case because I do think that sooner or later, probably sooner than we think, we will be able to simulate uh, human brains or close to that mm. um, in, a, in a computer. And once that happens, you're probably going to get the entire deal, right? I mean, you will get the intelligence, the thoughts, the capability for emotions and for self-consciousness. I do think that when we reach that level, we will also understand which parts of our brain, especially the simulated ones, actually control self-consciousness and mm -hmm. emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can, you know, in a way, you, there are some people that uh, get, uh, you know, with, that uh, their brain gets damaged, and they can, they can basically can't feel emotions anymore. Um, so I think we can do that to simulated brains as well, but. For some very unique robots and, and uh, simulations, we actually won't want to do that. We will want a robot that can have emotions and possibly, yes, walk out the door on you. Because what, what, you know, what does love mean 
if you can love somebody, but it's not real love unless they return the, the, the favor. And, that's, and they have to choose to love you. So if we want robo, um, robots that we can love, that we can have sex with, as some people say that we'll have in a few decades from now, I think it's pretty important that we'll also let them have the, the option of saying that this is not the kind of relationship I want to be in. So this brings me to a new question, which relates to your answer, and it regards to the levels and boundaries of the interaction between the two, the machine and the human being. So when we interact with our friends, obviously the police control is trying usually to affect our minds, but we, we seem to have our own free thinking about life. With robots and machines, the danger is that third parties may control, interact in an appropriate way, try to affect the behavior of such machine through, um, through third parties or from a, from a distance. So how would you consider protecting the relationship, maybe through cyber elements, through other, I mean, protection measurements, those robots or those machines from harming the human beings in, during the interactions? Oh, that's, a, you know, that's a big question, honestly. And I'd like to divide it into two parts. First, how do, do we protect robots from cyber intrusion? And the second, how do we protect humans from robots and robots from humans? Exactly. So about the cyber security, um, robots should theoretically possess cybersecurity measures at the individual robot level without being connected to the cloud. Now, why am, I say, why am I saying theoretically? Because some robots will almost certainly be too small to run proper defense measures, right? I mean, uh, for example, the smart pacemakers that we install in some people's chests, actually, they can't really run good, uh, uh, good cyber defense measures. They're just too small and it requires too much of comp computation force um, power. But in general, yes, robots should be able to disconnect from the cloud and still protect themselves. I think that's the, that's the, the last line of defense that we should have for robots. Uh, because unless you do that, somebody will eventually break into your robot. But I would go a step beyond that. We need to understand what kind of components we install in our robots, because some, possibly most of the component, components today, already have a back door, right, for one of the global superpowers, China, the United States, um, allegedly, right? <laughs> but allegedly. that's a very good point. I have, yeah, so, so you need to be very careful about the components you use. And we already see firms like Google, like Apple, actually they're starting to develop and manufacture their own chips. And that's an astounding uh, development because in a connected world, who would have thought that they would invest so much in that? But they want to be sure about what's, yeah, what's happening in those, uh, in those chips. Now, of course, you never know because the US government could order them to install back, back doors in those chips as well. And if that happens, the companies are not allowed to expose that to the public. And that has happened before. I'm not just, you know, I'm not a conspiracy the uh, theorist here because we do know it's happened before with the US uh, government when it required um, the large internet and computer firms, Microsoft, IBM, Google, and so on, to give them information about their users. And the companies were not even allowed to spill the beans to the public. So if they were asked directly, are you sharing information with the US government? They had to say no. They had to say, that, to say it fervently so people will believe them. You couldn't just you know, drop clues here and there. By the way, the only one who objected to, this, to that demand was Yahoo. And it was very, fined very heavily for that and still couldn't expose to the public what was going on. So yeah, cyber, you need to find a way to protect the robots, definitely. Now about human and robot interaction. So a few years ago, a French committee on the on the issue of AI and autonomy decided that we must not trust 
AI and robots with our lives, as long as we don't understand how they make their decisions. Wow. And oh, yeah, heavy. this applies especially to autonomous cars because they make decisions based on the workings of an artificial neural network, right? And we don't have any good theory at the moment to explain how those artificial neural networks reach their decisions. We have some guesses, we know how to trim their, their architecture a little bit, um, but we don't have a good theory on how they work. And that's, you know, that's not surprising because we don't have a really good theory about how the brain works either. And artificial neural networks are not a simulation of the brain that's incredibly simplistic, but they are um, a simulation of some aspects of the brain, of nodes, thousands and millions of nodes connected to thousands of other nodes. Um, so we do know that we can train artificial neural networks in many ways, right? You show them enough pictures of a cat, they understand it's a cat. And they develop an, an implicit understanding of what it is we're training them for. But ask a little kid, how do you know how, that this is a cat after you show him many, many pictures? He won't be able to understand it, to, to explain it easily. Ask a human being, how do I know when I, that when I throw a ball, I, I, I know where it will land, right? I know it's, it's trajectory, but I know it without knowing Newton's laws of, uh, of motion. So we can't really, even, even we, who have brain inside, we can't really explain always how the brain reaches its, uh, its insights. Um, now, there is nothing to do about that in human beings, right? I mean, I'm not, we're not going to, uh, to, to, to eliminate most of the population who don't understand how the brains work. But when it comes to robots, we need to have a pretty solid theory on how they work, how they make their decisions, so that we can predict their reactions in unexpected situations. Without that, it's going to be very difficult to trust robots. I do think that we'll trust them anyway, because the advantages of moving things over to, you know, moving driving over to autonomous cars are just uh, too great to do otherwise. And I do want to say here, if, okay, can, I, can I say a few words here? Of course, you're more than welcome, of course. Oh, thank you. So in Kai Fu Lee's uh, book, um, Superpowers, I think, AI Superpowers, he explicitly mentioned the, the conflict of values between the Western world and China. Um, and I'm not quite sure his explanation is correct because obviously he has to align himself with, the, with what the Chinese government is saying, but, but still, it's interesting. What he says is that in places like the US, or in any democratic country, really, um, you can't allow robots to go on the road unless they are incredibly safe and secure. I mean, one accident uh, will basically stop all the experiments until it is being uh, dissected and analyzed very, very carefully. Um, and uh, even then things will take a lot of time for, you know, for the Congress to approve of robots and so on. Whereas go to China and according to Kai Fu Li, China takes another, a different approach on the ethics of robots. It takes a utilitarian approach. And what does the government say implicitly, you know, without actually saying it? The government believes, the Chinese government believes that when taxi drivers and the ordinary drivers on the roads are all replaced by autonomous cars, then the number of fatalities on the road is going to dramatically go down as well. Um, the number of people injured on the road in traffic accidents will dramatically go down. So we want to get to that point as soon as possible. Now, how do they actually do that by letting autonomous cars travel the roads without knowing that they are completely safe and secure. So some people are going to lose their lives, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fact of life. But if you take a utilitarian approach, then the, the earlier that you train those machines 
and the more you let those uh, autonomous cars go go on the road and uh, you know collect miles and 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 understand how to drive, the sooner you get to that point when they will replace human drivers altogether. So yeah, you're going to lose a few lives, but you, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand, I don't know. But you're going to save millions of lives and, and, uh, and millions of people, uh, you know, you know of limbs every year because of that small sacrifice that you made during those years. Obviously, it's not, you know, it's not the, let's put it like that, it's probably not uh, the Chinese chairman of the Communist Party that's going to lose his life, but still, wow, you, see, you see the logic here. Yeah, um, and honestly, I can't say automatically that this logic is wrong. I mean, I see the, I see the problems with it, but I also see the, uh, the upsides. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there is a lot to think about when it comes to robots and how do we train them, how do we let them work with human beings, and so on. Super interesting, Ori. Thank you so much. And last question with your permission for today. We don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I'm sure that I personally and our audience as well will be interesting to understand what kind of interesting projects or research are you currently watching? Obviously, be, besides your own, I'm sure that any of our audience that will start following you after this podcast or just by knowing you, uh, it will find, they will find it very interesting to understand what interests you. Okay, so there are several things that interest me. Um, I, I guess we are constrained by time, but still. Um, so first, it's interesting, interesting for me to see um, artificial neural networks being created that actually simulate the, how the brain works and actually simulate how the brain works with artificial neurotransmitters and, and all that. Um, and this is starting to happen right now. We know of some very interesting research in, in, that, uh, in that field. And I think people don't understand just how much of a revolution it, it can be because these kinds of, this kind of artificial neural networks will allow us to understand much better how our brains work. And that has huge implications when we want to, uh, when we want to correct the way our brains work um, from schizophrenia, from depression, um, from bipolar, well, well, you know, all the, pardon, oh, pardon my French, all this shroom that, uh, that, that, that follows us because we evolved in such a screwed up way. Sorry again. Um, and in the far away future, but again, it may not be the, as far as we think it could conceivably be, be here in a decade or two. That's unlikely, but it could happen we will even be able to create an artificial neural network that simulates an entire human brain. And that's where things will truly get interesting because those neural networks will have thoughts, feelings, self-consciousness. We need to consider what that means. Um, another another uh, issue that interests me is autonomous programs that can work on the cloud. Um, and I'm not talking about the cloud as in someone else's uh, server but I'm talking about the cloud in a way similar to, uh, to, to what the blockchain revolution of Ethereum was all about, of thousands and millions of computers contributing together to uh, some kind of a computing process. And no one can really stop that process and unless everyone, or at least 51%, however you want to, 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 uh, to define the system, unless, 51% of the people agree that this is not the kind, the right kind of program that you want to run without control. So essentially what you can pretty easily create autonomous programs that can work on the cloud. And once you have programs like that doing sophisticated work, you have a new entity on the world stage that you need to consider. And it is not human. It does not necessarily have human's best interests in mind. Um, it'd probably be something closer to the AI described in uh, Nick Bostom's paperclip factory, right? Where you, you tell an AI that its mission is to create paperclips and the AI is so smart, but that isn't its entire purpose. And it just starts 
making the, uh, turning the entire world into paperclips because that's its ultimate uh, goal. So it's going to be very different from what human beings know. And that's uh, quite frightening and quite exciting as well, right? I mean, we need to figure out how to control it. But then again, we, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what it could come up with, what kind of inventions, what kind of innovations, and so on. Um, and one last thing. I am carefully watching and I'm very concerned about AI actually managing people, telling them what to do. And we can see that in, uh, in Amazon's warehouses, at least according to the reports that we receive from there. Uh, what you have in Amazon's warehouses, you have robots fully interacting with human beings, right? Uh, you know, you remember Kura uh, Robots? I think that was the name of the company that Amazon acquired a few years ago. Yeah, so the robots bring the shelves to the human worker and the entire work that the human being needs to do is to take the package you know, on the table, put it on the shelf. The robot goes away, another robot comes, the, the human takes the package, put it on the shelf, and so on. And they do that for hours upon hours, and it's pretty horrible, because the AI also constantly monitors all the workers. It quantifies how long it takes them to put the items on the, on the robots. If it takes you too long, then you get fired automatically. If you want to take a break, well, tough break. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't do this without being fired. Um, so a worker who got, to, work, who got to, to the work an hour late because she had to attend her mother's funeral, got fired automatically. There is no emotion there. There is no place for misgivings. And it's the worst kind of AI, the one that turns humans into the image of robots that we've had for the last couple of decades, just walking and walking and walking. That's the robota of Carl Chapek's play, from which the world robot came from. And we all know what happened to those robots in the end. They actually uprose against uh, mankind, except what happens when humans are the ones who need to walk so hard that they eventually rebel. And who are they going to rebel against? They're going to rebel against the robots. And in a way that's starting to happen right now but um because of the work has been uh, de-skilled so much i mean you don't even need to know what's happening on the shelves you don't need to go through the warehouse you just need to sit and do the same job again and again without thinking about it then amazon can can easily fire anyone who objects to those harsh conditions and then it can, can hire new people from the street um, and it's very reminiscent of the first and second industrial revolution in which people with very little skill, even kids, were hired to look after the machines and, you know, pull this lever, pull the other lever, pull this lever, pull the other lever. So it's very clear that new ethical rules and regulations must be instituted to prevent workers from being exploited by the AI and that the people who control that AI that manages the people on the bottom they need to be held accountable for whatever it is that the AI is doing. And I think if we don't um, have rules and laws about that, and if we don't enforce them very carefully and very stringently, then we're going to see um, AI doing some pretty scary um, shit, sorry again, um, and nobody being held accountable for that. So accountability, 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 and that will translate into responsibility. Responsibility, responsibility. Okay, I said my, I said my stuff. <laughs> Dr. Roy Cezana, thank you so much for your participation. We learned a lot, I learned a lot, and it's such an honor to have you as part of our guest in this podcast. Um, to our guests, to the people who are listening to us, Dr. Tezana has a very active uh, social media profiles. We'll put down a link to his social uh, media profile so you can follow and learn new things. Wei, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.